I'd like to say good day to uh, everyone that is here to join us for the uh, lectionary Bible study, which we are now doing a couple of times a week during uh, the season of uh, Easter, and soon it will be the season of Pentecost. Uh, we are still in a lockdown situation, and there are many people that I run into around town as I'm going to the grocery store getting gasoline that ask me if we're meeting on Sundays yet. And of course the answer is no. Uh, we as a church, Slater United Methodist Church here in Slater, Texas, uh, take our cues from our Central Texas Annual Conference. And when uh, your bishop tells us it is okay for us to open and meet in person and we will uh, follow up and do that soon afterwards. I would ask you to uh, recognize that uh, our Bible study today is going to be on Ascension Sunday text from the Revised Common Lectionary Year A. This is uh, the last Sunday before we get to the texts for Pentecost. And uh, I would tell you that even though no one has actually emailed in any questions to our website or to our email, uh, I am still willing to, uh, with a couple of weeks lag, uh, take your questions, take them seriously, and uh, come up and frame answers uh, for those of you that, uh, that are interested in such things. Um, the two texts that we're going to do today are, the first one is Acts 1, uh, ver verses 1 through 11, and then we will move on and briefly look at uh, Psalm 47. These are both texts from the Revised Common Lectionary for the uh, Sunday of Ascension. Now, Ascension itself is on the previous Thursday. Uh, it's, a, it's Thursday, I believe, the 24th, uh, if memory serves me correctly. But um, we are going to celebrate it on the Sabbath, and uh, the text for uh, preaching will be the one from Luke, which we will deal with later in the week. Uh, I would, uh, I would say that if I was going to give a title to today's lesson from the book of Acts, the first lesson, uh, as we remember during the season of Easter, and of course, Ascension is uh, included in uh, the season of Easter, we do not have any Hebrew scripture texts or what some people call the Old Testament texts. Uh, of course, we always have the psalm, but the Old Testament text, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, 1st 2nd Samuel, the prophets, and so forth, we don't have those texts during Easter because we use the book of Acts to, uh, as a history book to replace those Hebrew scripture texts. But if I was going to give a title to our lesson today, which is a lesson from Acts, 1, 1 through 11, I would call it something like looking back, looking forward, looking up. Back, forward, up. That would be uh, a, a decent title and a, a good way to sort of organize the text that uh, we have before us. The book of Acts begins very uh, uh, propitiously with uh, Luke writing, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Um, in a, a very serious sense, this uh, book of uh, of, of Acts and uh, the book or the Gospel of Luke are 
things that uh, end up being uh, two volumes in a two volume work. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people have even suggested that Luke had planned a third volume after the book of Acts that uh, told the story about Paul uh, traveling from Rome all the way to Spain. Of course, that never happened. Uh, Paul never made it to Spain, and Luke never wrote about it. But Luke did write the gospel, and then he writes uh, the book of Acts. And so one is the story of Jesus. The, the other, Acts, is the story of the early church, or the story of Jesus as the Christ, and then the story of the Holy Spirit as uh, that which births the church on the day of Pentecost. In a way, the, the uh, story that we have before us today about the ascension is in many ways kind of a hinge uh, in sort of an oddity of the New Testament. Uh, Luke finishes his gospel in Luke 24 with the story of the ascension. And of course, we will come to that uh, later this week. Um, but he also, interestingly enough, begins the book of Acts with the story of the Ascension. And they're not identical, although, of course, they're similar. Uh, some people have wondered if uh, Luke forgot what he was doing when he finished the gospel and couldn't remember and repeated himself, like like Grandpa does uh, at Thanksgiving when he tells the same stories over and over and over again. I have been accused of that by many people, my grandchildren, my children, and multiple churches. They say that I just tell the same stories again and again and again. But for Luke, it, it's not an accident. Uh, it's a fitting conclusion to the gospel that Jesus is, is taken up uh, to be with God and sit at God's right hand. And uh, secondly, it's a perfect way to open the story of the church and the coming of the Holy Spirit where Jesus physically uh, absents himself from the disciples and therefore the Spirit comes and then the story of the church without the physical presence of Jesus, is told to the end of the book of Acts. So looking back, um, Luke is telling uh, Theophilus, who was probably his patron, where Theophilus means lover of God. It could be an individual person, or it could also be a, a, a group of people that love God, lovers of God in a way. But one way or another, most scholars believe that Theophilus was an individual and a patron of Luke's. He paid Luke's uh, rent. He paid for Luke's food and clothing and so forth so that Luke, uh, like an artist, could spend all of his time uh, concentrating on writing first the gospel and then the book of Acts. Uh, Michelangelo, when he painted the Sistine Chapel, which took him over two years, uh, was uh, a person that had a patron that just happened to be the Pope. And so Pope, um, uh, I can't remember, I remember the Pope that followed, oh, Pope Julius uh, was the one that spent much money and time uh, keeping Michelangelo uh, fed and clothed so he could do this work. The Pope after Julius, of course, was Pope Clement. And uh, many of the popes turned out to be patrons for uh, many of the artists, painters, sculptors, and uh, so forth. And uh, so the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were written by Luke, who probably had a patron in this individual person named Theophilus. The second thing is, looking forward, beginning with verse 3, we're told uh, about uh, the many convincing proofs 
of the resurrection. In other words, uh, the the things that the God, that the uh, apostles grasp were things that they saw about uh, the resurrection. Uh, the the disciples spent forty days with Jesus after the resurrection, before the ascension, learning all the things that they needed to know when they were soon to be on their own, only uh, augmented by uh, the Holy Spirit that came on behalf of the Trinity. So um, they have a question. <coughs> this question is, uh, are you the one who is to restore um, the kingdom to Israel? And in a way, Jesus just sort of dismisses this question, uh, telling them that they ought not to ask that, that that has something to do with the reestablishment of Israel and what Jesus was all about, if you read the Gospels and, and then eventually Acts, is that Jesus is about establishing the new realm of God, the new kingdom of God. And so, in a sense, instead of looking back to Israel, what Jesus does is helps the community of faith look forward to the coming reign of God. And uh, the last thing that happens uh, today is looking up, and it is uh, a description of the ascension, and it's brief, and it's seamless. It's just really one verse that tells us about Jesus being uh, taken up into heaven. Uh, when he was going and they were gazing up to heaven, suddenly two men in white robes came and stood by them after Jesus had been taken up. And they asked them basically, uh, people of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come down in the same way that you saw him go up into heaven. And uh, so one of the things that Jesus does right before he ascends into heaven is he gives his disciples a charge, and that charge is in Acts 1-8. I think it's the most important verse in the book of Acts because what it does is it gives us an outline about how the rest of the Acts of the Apostles will be written and plays out. So it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, my martyrs, in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, what Jesus does right before he leaves is first, he gives the disciples a mission and then he also gives them a roadmap about how to take care of that particular mission. Uh, the ascension really inaugurates the coming of the Holy Spirit and the mission to which the disciples have been asked to uh, undertake. Now, after, um, after uh, the book of uh, Acts text, we're going to look at uh, Psalm uh, 47. And uh, what Psalm 47 does for us is it instructs us about uh, how and why we should praise God. Let me read this in case you don't have a text in front of you. This is what it says. It's in the New Revised Standard Version. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud shouts of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued people under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. Uh, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is King of all the earth, 
sing praises with a song. God is king over all the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of God of Abraham. For the shield of the earth belongs to God. He is highly exalted. In, so, in some ways, I suppose you could say that this is a fairly straightforward and fairly simple uh, psalm that we have, number 47. It, uh, it really uh, summons all people. It not only summons the Hebrew people, uh, and of course the psalms was their hymn book, but it also suggests that God is king over the nations. And that word nations can also be translated Gentiles. And so what this means is that this psalm says that God or Yahweh is a sovereign over all people everywhere. Hebrews, Gentiles, um, and that, that's pretty much it. So, what are these people that are summoned and to sit under the feet of this sovereign authority of Yahweh to do? They are to worship. And they worship by shouting, by clapping their hands, by singing hymns and songs. And uh, there are a good number of songs that uh, encourage people to worship and to praise God in one way or another. Uh, Israel exists to serve God, not God exists to serve Israel. And so at the end of the worship, we have something like a mission uh, for these people, and as Isaiah will later say, to be a light to the nations, to be a light to the Gentiles, to be a light to all people everywhere and to allow people to understand that Yahweh is supreme, Yahweh is sovereign, Yahweh is the king.